What's the worst thing about sports? That's right, all those unnecessary breaks in play. But you can make them all better by using Grubhub. Grubhub has every food you can possibly crave, from national favorites to local spots. Grab your first order from the Grubhub app, or visit Grubhub.com. That's Grubhub.com. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. That's zero food delivery fees from your favorite restaurants. Visit GoForGrubhub.com slash Amazon for terms and details. Go for Grubhub. Do you want an exciting career with unlimited potential? Demand and salaries for certified aircraft maintenance technicians have hit record levels and are still on the rise. Approved by the Federal Aviation Administration, Vaughn's Airframe and Power Plant Certification Program can put you on the path to a future-proof career in as little as 16 months. Come to Vaughn's on-campus info session Thursday, February 16th at 6 p.m. and learn about career options, the industries you can work in, how you can apply for free, and have a chance to win a scholarship. Register today at VaughnInfoSession.com. You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Hello, 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 everybody. How's it going? Hopefully you're doing great out there in podcast land and you are listening to this show, relaxing, maybe you know, washing some dishes or walking your dog, hopefully something nice. I am here to tell you that we have a great episode today, episode 494, which is wild to say that because we are... <laughs> approaching the 500th episode, which, uh, you know, I'll tell you about a little bit later on. But today we got Bobby Marcos, who plays in a band called Cloakroom, uh, previously was affiliated with a band called Native, uh, and Bobby will call me out if I am just completely um, missing the mark, but uh, I'm fairly certain he did play in Native, which was another great band, but let's focus on Cloakroom. Cloakroom just released an incredible record on Relapse called Dissolution Wave. And uh, I love the thing. I love this band. has elements of hum, stoner rock, everything I love. They create a lot of atmosphere. It's so cool. Their first LP came out in Run For Cover. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I love the band. And I wanted to have Bobby on the show. was able to make it happen around the press and promo of this new record. So here we go. And he also has a whole history with NASCAR racing, which is something I never really thought I would talk about on this particular podcast, but we do. We engage in it, and uh, he also is a producer or executive producer. He is affiliated with a uh, really, really interesting documentary series called Lost Speedways with Dale Earnhardt Jr., and if you did not see it, it was so cool because Dale Earnhardt Jr., I don't know if he did a race or just painted his car, but uh, did a, a, like I said, a race with a cloakroom like coat, I'm, I'm totally butchering like all of the appropriate language that you should use. But um, basically, it was a cloakroom car, a race car, and it was so cool. So, anyways, Bobby was a great chat. But let's talk about how you can help the show because uh, you know people ask me that. Well, first of all, you can email the show 100 words podcast at gmail dot com. I always appreciate those little notes, check ins, being like, "Yo, I listened to the show. I like what you got going on." Or maybe, "Hey, you should uh, shut up and let your, your guest talk a little bit more." I, I get those occasionally. <laughs> But, you know, I take those with a grain of salt uh, for all the people that do say kind things about the show. I do appreciate it. I welcome all those comments going to the inbox. And then you can also go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you consume the podcast, and uh, drop a review. Um, You know, maybe it is a five-star review. Maybe it's a one-star review. Of course, I would prefer a, a nice thing said because the internet is obviously full of negative negativity. But um, yeah, please do that. It takes like 10 seconds and it helps this show become legitimate. Um, yeah, I, I'm so excited. Let's just dive into the conversation with Bobby. Um, I, I, I learned a lot <laughs> because there's certain areas where he is uh, well versed in, especially with the whole NASCAR thing I was talking about. But um, like I said, Cloakroom, really good band. You need to listen to their whole catalog, but most specifically listening to their new record, Dissolution Wave. So check it out, and here's my conversation with Bobby. The 
my first introduction point to Cloakroom was the fact, like I mentioned uh, off mic, uh, was the fact that I love Native. Like I just, I saw, oh man, I'm trying to remember. I saw you guys once uh, out here in Southern California. I want to say it was at Chain Reaction, but I could be completely wrong. Because um, you guys obviously came out to Southern California, right, at one point? Yeah, um, I think the last time we would have been there would have been possibly with oh brother and um super heaven who at the time were called daylight and i know there we, we go that was it that was it maybe i don't know if we played chain reaction but i do know we played like a couple shows in the la area yeah and it, it escapes me you know which which spots we played at but that would have been the last the last time we were out there it might have been that gig yeah, yeah, no, and that definitely, yeah, that that resonates with me. But uh, I mean, I, I so I was already <clears throat> interested in what you guys were collectively doing and individually doing after Native, uh, you know, stopped touring and actively putting out music. And what I find interesting, I mean, especially from the fact that uh, you know, Cloak Room was cl- clearly formed in the Indian Greater Indianapolis area, and uh, no one pays attention to your music scene in general. Like, and I I don't mean that in a bad way, just in a, people often overlook the fact that there's a scene there, there's bands that play there. And um, it it always is kind of a surprise when it's like, Hey, where are you from? It's like, Oh, Indianapolis. People like, Oh, you guys play music there? Really? (laughs) It's like, yeah, there, there's something happening. Does that often get reflected back to you that people are are surprised that you guys are located where you're at? Well, uh, yeah, no, honestly, uh, believe it or not, we, we really, we have more in common with, with Chicagoland because, you know, we're, we're actually a couple hours north of Indianapolis. Um, we're up in the northwest corner of the state and, and we're pretty much considered Chicagoland. Like we live in an area, we, it's called the region. Um, and it, you know, it's like the top two northwest counties of, of Indiana. And we're even on a separate time zone than the rest of you know, rest of the state, like we're on Chicago time because so many people from our area commute to Chicago for work. Um, so yeah, we, we've always been, but, but yeah, we do. I mean, we we've always considered ourselves an Indiana band. And I think a lot of bands from our area were like, Oh, we're from Chicago, you know? And like, we're always like, well, we're from Indiana, you know, like we're kind of proud of it. And I think it does, I know there's not a lot of bands from our state. Like I know like, you know, like murder by death and like John Cougar Mellon camp. And I think, you know, maybe Axl Rose was from Lafayette. So like there hasn't been like a real long list of like musicians and you're right. Like Indianapolis, there are cool venues down there, but it's not like an a market for bands to go and play in, you know? So, um, I don't know. I don't know how, how people perceive that. You know, I know a lot of bands tend to be from bigger, bigger areas like LA and, and in Chicago and New York and, and now Boston and Philly. Um, but now we've, we've always just, I kind of dig being like the big fish in the small pond, you know, and like um, cloakroom always being from, you know, like I said, being from Northwest Indiana, like we're really the only band. I mean, you know, really one of the only bands that are getting out on the road and, and doing a lot of the things we do, you know, and, yeah, you can wave that flag, and it's not like there are 400 other bands waving that same flag. Yeah, exactly. Like, there are bands here for sure, but, um, you know, a lot of them don't really travel, and overwhelming percentage of them are, like, bar cover bands, you know? And really, we're not even that embraced in, if you want to call it the Northwest Indiana scene, which it really isn't a scene. It's like, oh, me and your mom went to the bar on Friday night, and there was a band playing, you know? like that's 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 really about what it gets down to there's not like like shows or like concerts it's just bar bands you know so we my dad always calls me and and we you know we talk every day and i'll be like oh yeah dad you know it's cool like we we had this awesome write up in stereo gum or or pitchfork or something he's like yeah he's like did the guy from the northwest indiana times get to you yet i'm like no i don't think the entertainment writer for the end, uh, you know, for the Northwest Indiana Times is even aware of our existence because he he's covering the local bar bands, you know, and we don't we don't really play that scene. Like if we play locally, it's usually in Chicago or maybe, you know, like at a friend's house in the area, and it's like our own our own close knit community, you know. So right, um, yeah, no, it, I think you know, I think that that's just kind of like a, 
I don't know if you want to call it like a cloakroomism, you know, like one of the weird little things about us, but we do like pridefully say we're from the region, you know, like I think it's just, it's a, it's a part of how we formed and it's really kind of like the whole backstory is that we all just like grew up in this weird little zone and uh, we wouldn't have found each other had it not been for that. You know what I mean? And I don't think we would sound the way we sound had we not been from this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I completely understand where you're coming from, especially too, where it's like you said, there's this, you know, regionality that doesn't exist within music anymore because you can kind of be anywhere, obviously, and not have to sound like the, you know, 20 bands in your general area um, because that's the only touch point you have because, you know, the internet. (laughs) But but to your point, like, yeah, I mean, especially with the idea of the, you know, you joking around with your father and that that validity that can come with you being covered in your local newspaper where it's like, oh, my parents think I'm a legitimate human now because, <laughs> but you're like, that doesn't matter at all in any capacity. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It, it, I, you know, my dad, he's just ribbing me and he, he thinks it's funny because like, it it is kind of funny that if your job if you work for like a regional newspaper, a localized newspaper, and your job is to cover entertainment in an area that is so sparse for entertainment, really, you know, and like you're mainly covering bands, like, and you have no idea to, that within your within your area, like in the next town over, there's a band that has put out records internationally and toured internationally. You're not acting like we're the Beatles or something, but I mean, we've done like a good amount of stuff in the last 10 years, you know, for, for, especially for a band from Indiana. Um, I think my dad just laughs that like somehow we're underneath this guy's nose, this writer's nose, and he has no clue at all, you know? And, uh, I always, I mean, I, I, I hope that there's a day when he like, su- like we somehow get on his radar and he's like, oh my God, this band's from Chesterton. Right. You know, <laughs> they, re- they recorded this record in Chesterton and I had no idea. I was too busy covering like, you know, um, this band playing at Leroy's Hot Stuff on Friday night. You know what I mean? So, right. Um, well, you're kind of, hey. <laughs> totally. Well, I, I think the strategy there is that you need to, uh, you know, basically make a sign that says uh, cloakroom live music tonight, because that is really the only way that you can be viewed in that spectrum because you know it, it, it's exactly what you're talking about where it's like oh yeah you go to a friday night and there's a band playing a bar like does it matter no it's live music bro and <laughs> that's it they might play like hotel california or something like they're gonna play songs you know you know and like you're gonna have your you know your steak and potatoes or whatever you eat and and yeah you know like that is the scene you know and i like i said like i i i owe every time we put a record out whoever is doing publicity for it i always am like you know, they'll ask, they'll always ask like, what publications do you, you know, typically try to aim for to be written up? And I always want to jokingly be like, can you hit up like the Gary Post Tribune or can you hit up the Northwest Indiana Times and see if they'll finally give us just a little spotlight, you know, but we never do it. We're just waiting for it to organically happen. But <laughs> totally. You're, and then you, then you come in with your, uh, you know, eight minute bummer rock songs and they're like, what the hell is this? These guys have <laughs> These guys have no place in our paper. Oh, we wouldn't go over very well. I mean, you know, you think, I think you probably minimum would have to play three hours worth of music and you'd have to play all covers. And we've got like maybe a Tom Petty cover, uh, a Songs Ohio cover. We don't have a lot in our repertoire as far as that goes. And they don't want to hear any cloakroom songs, I'm sure. So no, <laughs> right, right. It's okay. It's, we'll, yeah. we'll, fi- we'll figure it out. Uh, we'll, we'll offline that and figure out how to break you in there. <laughs> But um, it, putting the focus on you, I know, like you mentioned, you know, born and raised in the area, you know, have have grown up and grown a, a fondness and attachment for the area, uh, which is cool because I know that a lot of the quintessential Midwestern experience is like, oh, I'm in my city, I got to get the hell out of here in order to get some culture. Um, what was your, I guess, like family structure and you know, brothers and sisters in the house as you were growing up? Um, I was an only child, and. Um you know, I, I had a pretty close relationship with my parents. Like we, you know, they, they always, I think like early in life, they kind of probably pushed me to do, you know, the typical like suburban things like, you know, oh, you should probably play a team sport or you probably do something, you know? And like, I think 
we I think I played like one season of Little League and we quickly discovered that that like was not going to be my my bag, you know. So, uh, I, you know, I got in the skateboarding and got into music and, and they always kind of were just like, well, you know, as, as long as you continue to get good grades, we'll let you we'll let you do your thing. So I had a, a really good, you know, like a, a, su- a super awesome like upbringing in that regard. Like I had a great relationship at home and su- a super supportive household to be in and, and still do to this day. Like I, I mentioned, like I, I still talk to my parents every day and, and keep them filled in on my world and try to get over there at least once a week for a visit. And, uh, you know, we, we still maintain that for sure. That's cool. Especially I, I can identify with the only childness cause I myself am one and I am raising an only child. There you and go. It, yeah. It, it's, it is interesting because I do think there is that level of whether it's conscious or unconscious thought that goes through a parent's mind that you're you're left to kind of do whatever you want. And I mean that in a positive way where it's just like the parents can put all the resources they possibly can towards you. They're not dividing their attention and being like, oh, we got to take Bobby to the you know skating rink. We got to do this person for this person. And like, you're just kind of throwing a bunch of stuff out there. And I know that that happens for an only child as well, but you can be a little more focused in it. And once there's like any little inkling of interest, it's like, all right, let's just focus on that. We don't need to, you know, drive around to terrible little league games or whatever. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I dug, I dug the dynamic in our household. Like, you know, my, my dad, he, he tried to, or he always was good to like involve me in his interests. And like, he shared the things he was into with me and, and we still share that bond, you know? And like, like my mom is just, you know, the sweetest little woman ever. And it, it was just psyched on like everything that I did. Like I could like, I mean, you know, draw a square on a paper and she would be psyched and hanging on the fridge. So like I said, I had like a really strong infrastructure there, you know? And like I said, when it finally came time for me to kind of figure out who I was and, and, and realize that I had a real knack and drive to be a musician they were super supportive and, you know, helped me get my, my first bass and my first amp and, and let me and all my buddies learn to play guitar in our basement, even though it was probably really annoying to hear the same Nirvana riffs like a thousand times played really poorly, you know, but, uh, of course, but they were, they were all about it, you know? And like, and I, and I, I liked, I know that, you know, I, I grew up prob and I probably have like a lot of weird, things in my brain that I'm, I'm learning to undo and, and probably some like kind of bratty tendencies from being an, an only child. But, and I, I, I'd probably be a, a more well-rounded person had I had older brothers or sisters or younger brothers and sisters, but I liked not having to compete for, you know, my parents' attention. And, and I kind of liked being their world, you know, and um, they did a really good job of making me their world. You know what I mean? Like I, I never felt like I was like, I don't know, like, uh, you know, trying to compete for attention or, or start for attention or anything. Yeah, absolutely. No, I totally get that. And, and so, like you said, you were, uh, you know, attracted to music and bass guitar was kind of your first instrument. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, me and my best buddy, Zach Montez, who coincidentally is, you know, essentially the fourth member of Cloakroom, like he's our full-time engineer and he does all of our records and he travels with the band and, and does our live sound too. But he and I, we grew up together and, um, you know, when we were getting into middle school, um, you know, we were really, really into music, especially like Nirvana and, and, and other nineties bands. And I think it really kind of just, he had guitars, you know, his parents got him guitars and, uh, you know, we would go to his house on Friday nights or, you know, for like our weekly sleepovers. And, um, I think like we would just, you know, instinctively just started trying to learn to play the guitars, you know? So I think like he had the lead guitar handled and figured we needed a bass, but we didn't have a bass. So I think initially I was like learning the fundamentals on like an acoustic guitar, like a down-tuned acoustic guitar, you know, and just kind of like getting a feel for how a fretboard worked and like how hitting the strings worked, you know? And then as that continued to uh, sort of progress, that eventually led to me, you know, going you know, convincing my mom to go to the local pawn shop in Portage, Indiana, which was, it's, it's called Pawn King. And we went in there and I think the brand was like Lotus, <laughs> Lotus Space, which like Lotus guitars were, you know, probably not the greatest 
guitar brand, but uh, there was a bass there and, and was able to get it in a little amplifier. So I, I was, like you said, I was right in with bass from the ground level. That was the first thing I learned to play. Band merch is an investment as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> because, I mean, you probably maybe don't notice, but if you went back in your closet, pulled out a 15-year-old band shirt, and then went on to like Depop or any one of those other vintage places, you'd be shocked. So what better way to start your collection than visiting rockabilia.com and use this promo code 100 words or less that will give you 10% off of your order. And, uh, you know, while I am sort of being sarcastic about the, uh, you know, the old band merch, you know, it is kind of an investment. I'm just, just saying there. But what Rockabilia does is they stock all of the latest and greatest from all of your favorite brands of all genres. And what's cool is they actually, I've partnered with them on a promo code, 100 words or less, 10% off. They ship it from the Midwest, friendly customer service, independently owned business, and above all, this is officially licensed stuff, so the bands get paid for their merch, and that is an incredible lifeline for these times where bands aren't able to tour as much as they once did. I mean, the world is coming back a little bit to normal, but um, you know, having a income line from your merch is incredibly helpful. So rockabilly.com does it all. Have fun, visit the website, and use the promo code 100 words or less, 10% off your order, and enjoy. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. We've all been there. You know, life's going good, relationships are awesome, work's great, family life's great, and then all of a sudden, you know, some things start to happen. A wheel falls off. You, uh, you know, maybe have some issues at work, and then all of a sudden you're in a spot where you feel bogged down and you might not know who to turn to. Like, I don't want to bug my family or friends with this stuff. That is why I wholeheartedly endorse therapy. I've used it myself, and I think it is an incredible tool. That is why I love working with BetterHelp. Because if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. That is the key point. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if you feel like it. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can absolutely get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash words today and you get 10% off your first month. Please use the code and that way you can sign up with BetterHelp and live a more empowered life. That's betterhelp.com slash words. Try therapy. Like you said, you were you know getting into Nirvana and stuff like that. I'm I'm guessing was your touch point kind of you know MTV and that sort of stuff, or was it being infiltrated and introduced to you via friends and you guys bouncing back and forth with that? How that come into your life? Um, so I, you know, I think as far as I can remember, and 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 this is something that I, I do I, I talk about a little bit is um, it would have been in I was in fourth grade and you know, I, I got to the age where I had my own little TV in my room and, you know, I think through like channel flipping, I, I saw on TV or maybe, maybe it's something I observed in the living room in passing, but I saw like, I would see Kurt Cobain on TV and this would have been around the time, like this would have been like mid or, or, you know, like early to mid nineties, I'd see him on TV, you know, and, and, um, I was like, okay, that's like, you know, that's someone, that's a person. He's got long blonde hair. That's kind of cool. It looks a little like me. I don't know. And then I remember being at a, my parents' friend's house one New Year's Eve. It must have been in 93 and Nirvana did New Year's Eve that year, live and loud. And um, the, the they had teenagers and the teenagers were watching that. So that was like when I first saw them and I was like, whoa, this is like not, you know, the Beatles or, or whatever my parents are listening to on, on the radio, this is like something else. Like I, I, I didn't have the context to know that there was like old rock and new rock at the time. I was still a little too young to put it all together, you know, but I think like, then I'd go to the store with my mom and, you know, I'd see like Rolling Stone and they'd have Kurt Cobain on it. And I'd be like, Oh, that's that guy from TV. So I had like this weird, like kind of brain association with who he was and he must have been, I knew he was like in a band and stuff. And then that kind of just, I don't know. I, I, I think it, it, it just materialized into this weird fascination with him. And then, uh, 
I eventually put two and two together that he was in Nirvana. And by the time I started actively like listening to them, I missed him by a couple of years. Like, you know, from what I can calculate, like I would have missed him by a couple of years because like he had already passed away and, and, you know, obviously Nirvana wasn't a band anymore, but like this would have been right when they put out that like live from the Muddy Banks live CD. Like, I think like it was right around that time when I really like, I think I convinced my mom to buy me a copy of Nevermind on cassette tape. So, uh, and that was on my own, you know, like everyone else that I was in grade school with, they were listening to like, I think that was like right when like Eminem was starting to happen and like, you know, bands like, you know, Kid Rock and like Limp Biscuit and things were like starting to materialize. And like, I was like really into Nirvana and I think it just like consumed me. You know, I think there was like a four year period where like, that was all I listened to was Nirvana. Like I would just get like each cd until i had the whole discography and then i'd wear them out i would just like listen and listen and listen and i was just like so psyched on it you know um right and, right and i couldn't get any of my friends into them like all my friends were preoccupied with like new metal and what was happening at the moment you know so um i was kind of like a lone a lone guy and then in when 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 we went to middle school and all the elementary schools kind of converged into like this one middle school. That was when I reconnected with Zach. Like Zach and I had gone to daycare together when we were like four and five years old and we didn't go to the same elementary school. But when we reconnected in sixth grade, he was in a Nirvana because his dad was like an old school, like kind of metalhead. And he was like, he was like hip, hip to it, you know? So I was like, okay, psych. Like, that's awesome. Like my old buddy, he's with it. Like we can get into this together. And that was kind of like, our middle school was kind of like a uh, a few years late dive in the grunge music, right? <laughs> you got, I yeah. mean, that's cool. It's cool that you once you find a person that you can start to at least share your uh, cultural context with. That's when you know you can really pour gasoline on the fire, and then all of a sudden start to introduce each other to different bands and just start to put the idea that like, oh, you know. Kurt Cobain wore this shirt. Obviously, I'm going to listen to the Melvins or whatever. Yep, exactly. I think uh, I was just talking the other day about, you know, would have been right when Napster and LimeWire and BearShare were happening, you know? So when we were having those sleepovers, we'd go on those and we'd type in Nirvana or Kurt Cobain and then we'd download like every track. So not only did we have like their six actual releases, but then all of a sudden you start getting like, earth featuring kurt cobain and then you've got like these two sixth graders listening to earth and it's like well that's interesting you know and then like you said <laughs> the yeah. and like mud honey and and all these bands that like i should not have been exposed to that young because like one i was from indiana you know and two like the, you know that that stuff was already kind of passed you know it already it, it already passed by a couple of years and and I didn't have the, an older brother or like, you know, any older siblings to like kind of expose me to those bands. So like we got super lucky. We just happened to like stumble in the side door and we, and we got exposed to like all this really, really awesome music and it, and it shaped who we became, you know, and, and it opened the door. Like you were saying, like, you know, that was when I really became like an obsessed music lover. It was like once Zach and I reconnected, then it was like, Oh man, like, Whoa, Mud Honey covered this band called the Angry Samoans. What's that? Oh wow, here's punk music all of a sudden, you know? And then it's like that was the whole next phase, you know? So like um instead of, you know, getting into what was just on the radio, we were we were kind of hip. Like we were kind of getting into some some actually cool bands. Right. Well, and especially too for your area, like if you don't have the, you know, cool record store or, you know, cool radio station that's giving you that stuff you're just you know hunting and pecking for whatever you might trip across on the internet and make sure you're obviously downloading the right file yeah <laughs> so it's not yeah. it's not improperly labeled <laughs> yeah we definitely had a lot of fake like nirvana bootlegs like there were definitely and then they like i said then it would end up being like the like years later you would discover it was like oh this is houdini by the melvins <laughs> just like mislabeled as nirvana and we you know we got it off of bear share or whatever but yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like I said, like the you know kids my age were really into like rap music or or new metal, and and I was like, well, I mean, you know, whatever, that's that's cool, that's happening now, but like I just like couldn't get into it the same way 
I could get into like the the grunge bands and the alternative bands from earlier. You know, there was just something about it that resonated with me. And I think maybe the fact that I was the only one that was into it made it even more special and made me like it even more, you know, because I was like defiant in a way, you know, it wasn't like, you know what, I don't like Kid Rock and I'm not going to get, uh, you know, Devil Without a Cause. I'm going to get, you know, uh, Color and Shape by the Foo Fighters because Dave played in Nirvana. You know, like I was rebelling against my own age group or something. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, of course, you want to be, you know, antithetical to what is happening from people. You might be like, eh, I don't really like that person, so I'm not going to really care about the music that they listen to. I got to find my own thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, you, as you started to travel down the rabbit hole and discover all of these other, you know, interesting bands and music scenes and all that stuff, uh, was there any kind of, because I'm going to maybe typify a midwesterners experience but you know a lot of it is sort of very right in front of you as far as your future is concerned but it's like you know all right i'm gonna do this trade or i'm gonna you know work in the factory and again that's painting with a pretty broad brush but um was there a life path for you that you kind of saw you know opening up in front of you in regards to what you were going to do with the rest of your life yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, my the the only reason my family's here was because of the steel mills. You know, U.S. U.S. Steel built a huge mill like the size of a village here in Gary, Indiana, and like you know, three three generations before me came here from Hungary to work in the mill. You know, so my great grandfather worked there. My grandfather worked there. My dad worked there. And we're talking like lifers, like both my grandpa and my dad both worked out there for 35 plus years. So, you know, I think my dad didn't want me to do that. Like I was pretty good in school. I was getting good grades. And I think he was like always trying to pound it in my brain. Like you can do anything. You don't got to, you don't got to work at the mill. Like you can do anything, you know? Um, So I think, he was kind of pushing me to do something, you know, a little more, I don't know. I mean, you know, something more intellectually based for sure. Um, I was, I had a knack for writing. He, he's a writer. Like he was always a writer in his spare time. And I think I got it from him, you know? So I was, I was kind of a writer, but like, I didn't have like a path where I was like, Oh, I definitely want to be like a pharmacist or I definitely want to do this thing. Like I was kind of like just winging it, you know, I was pretty young. But I think had I not had I not gotten into music, had I not, you know, wrote and and had such a, a an interest in art in general, I probably would have ended up out there. And I really did end up out there, if I'm being completely honest with you. When I graduated um, from high school, you know, I was going to be going to community college and I was doing native at the time. Like we were just forming native and I knew we were going to start going on tour and stuff. Uh, but like in the meantime, you know, my dad was like, well, you need a job. And I got you a job at this like shop that's at the mill as like a contractor, but it's like not the mill, but it's like, it's a good paying like shop job. So I do that like three days a week and I bought gear with my money, you know, (laughs) like I wasn't like saving for a house or anything. I was like buying bases and, and like new amplifiers and stuff. So um, and I did that until Native became like a full time touring man, and then I split. So that was like my brief brush with uh, with the industry end of it. But I would say for for your average your average Indiana boy that grows up in this area, if he doesn't, you know, end up going to school to be an engineer or, or a teacher, or, um, you know, ABC you know, the industry is there and it's, and it's good paying work and you make a living and it's, and it's, you know, it's a secure, you know, it's a secure living. So I think like, that's the, that's the draw in this area is it was founded on that, you know? Sure. Absolutely. The, the, the practicality is I- inherent in that whole entire Midwestern section, especially too, because like, it's not like there is a replicable path that you see that people do in that area like you know if you want to pursue anything quote unquote creative people leave you know (laughs) so just that idea per you know being more pervasive in different communities is hard to entrench itself if there isn't an industry there oh yeah no for you're you nailed it like there there was no 
older artists or older musicians that like were doing it for a living where I was like, Oh yeah, that's what I want to do. It was like, you know, I very much grew up with the belief that was like, you know, art is fun. Music's fun. You know, writing's fun. These things are fun, but they're not like career paths, you know? So I think that, that definitely led to like native, just sort of, you know, native being like my first real, real band Um, it was just like, we had like a real punk rock mentality towards it It was like, well, we're going to do this and we're going to, you know, do this as hard as we possibly can until the wheels fall off. And then that's it. You know, it was never like, yeah, I really want to be a musician for a living, or I really want to, you know, do this for a living. Like we, you just, in our area, that wasn't a thing. Like had I grown up maybe in Chicago or, or New York or, or somewhere like that, like maybe that would be like a more realistic mindset. And maybe I would have handled the way that I I made art in the way that I, I kind of became an artist. I maybe would have done it earlier in my life, but, um, yeah, I, like I said, not, not in this area. Like we, we don't, you know, when we had career exploration class, like there was never anyone that was like, well, if you want to be a musician, you should be a musician. It was like, Oh, that's cool that you play a guitar. You should definitely look at this, you know, this job like over here instead, like it just wasn't, it wasn't a viable option at all. Right. You should, uh, oh, if you want to do that, you should make guitars. Yeah. <laughs> you should work with your hands. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that was like, I mean, you know, not nothing against my family, but that was always like, you know, they're all workers. Like everyone in the family is workers. Like a lot of them worked at the mill and like, you know, I'm talking like aunts, uncles and cousins. And, and anytime, you know, I, you obviously became known as a musician. Cause I was like one of maybe the, I might, I might be the only one in the family, one of very few at least. But it was always like, is there any money in that? Any money in that? I'm like, well, that's not really the point, you know. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something I love, and I'm creating things that are like important to me, and and I'm, and it's like sustainable enough that I can keep doing it for the moment. Like, I'm not thinking about it as like, yeah, there's a lot of money in this, you know. So, um, like I said, had there been other musicians in the family or something, maybe you know, maybe the mentality towards it would have been a little bit different, but I kind of, I kind of had to force the situation. And now here we are, you know, many years later and cloakroom has been a band for 10 years and I'm talking to you, you know, and we're putting this record out this, this, this week. And it's like, Oh, I guess, I guess it all worked out. I guess he, I guess he knew what he was doing or something, you know? So like, I think I had to kind of show the way and I hope that maybe I'll have a younger cousin one day that I'll see like, Oh wow, cousin Bobby made it as a musician. Maybe I should think of that. You know, I maybe I'll <laughs> I'll be the I broke the glass here in the family. Maybe I'll maybe I'll change things. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, there there's always that uh sort of canary in the coal mind where it's like if there as long as a person has a touch point, and it doesn't need to mean that you are in a, you know, successful uh stadium filling rock and roll band, it's like, oh, I could I could put all these creative things together. And then because of all these creative things, I'm able to and be involved with something that I enjoy. And that's like, you know, that's the, that's the real sweet spot that most creatives want to be in. So, yeah. Uh, um, Specifically with your, you know, I, I'm going to guess that native wasn't your first band, even though it was probably your most, I guess, serious band as far as getting out there and releasing records and stuff like that. Um, am I correct in that or no? Yeah. You, yeah. It wasn't my first band, but that was like the first, like that was when it stopped just being like, you know, high schoolers playing band in a, in a band together, like, and it became like a professional, like serious endeavor, you know? Yeah, for sure. And w- w- with native, I mean, like you said, when you kind of rolled up your sleeves and really started to, you know, you signed with Sergeant house and started to put out records and stuff like that. Um, did you like, I guess that uh, I, maybe this is two questions wrapped up into one, but uh, you know, did you like going out there and touring and did you like the business aspect of kind of getting records out there and working with record labels and booking shows and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we, you know, so, so Ed, Ed from native Ed O'Neill and I, we were in a high school band together. Like it would have been my junior and senior year in, in, his senior year and then his first year of undergrad. Um, and, and we, we did like a couple little tours. Like we, we, we strung some shows together. Like I said, I was, I was so young. I didn't have my driver's license. So we were like piling in the two cars. The, the, the whole band was, you know, and it was just with, with people we went to high school with, you know, and, um, 
we went and played some shows in like, you know, Michigan and Ohio and like the surrounding states, but got a feel for it, you know? And I was like, wow. And, and we were really weekend warriors. Like when we were in high school, we were gigging every weekend. Like we might play like a show in South Bend or like go to Michigan. Like we were traveling a little bit and we, we kind of got a feel for it. And we knew when that was coming to an end and we were like, okay, we need to find like a couple other musicians that are really serious about doing a band so that we can do this, you know? So we found Dan and Nick and they were in, you know, at the time they were in another band in their high school. And we knew that like the four of us were the most serious about being in a band out of our friend group. And we, our initial goal was like, we got to write some songs. We got to record those songs and we got to hit the road. We want to go everywhere, you know? So like we, we were so drawn to going on tour. Like that's all we wanted to do. You know, we didn't care where we played. We just wanted to go out there and play everywhere, you know? So um, I would say, yeah, I mean, it was like, as soon as I graduated high school, we started booking these tours that were like, all of a sudden we were going to Florida and we were going to Georgia. We were going to like all these places you've only seen on postcards, you know? So, and then, um, yeah, once, you know, we, we self-released that first EP, like we, we just made copies ourselves. We were like burning CDRs and spray painting stencil covers on them. And like, we were very, very punk in that regard and, and just kind of doing whatever we had to do to get our music in people's hands. And then once once we started working with Kathy and Sergeant House, we had so much to learn. We were so young, you know what I mean? Like I look back on how I handled that and part of me is like, man, like I was an idiot. But then I'm like, well, I was also like 19 years old. So I can't be too upset about it, you know, but I've I've really learned to appreciate you know, the roles that record labels play. And I've learned to appreciate, you know, the, the industry of putting out music and, and all that goes with it, you know, but, um, I, I, yeah, you know, I would say I, I've really learned to love and appreciate every aspect of being in a band, you know, especially at the level that I'm doing it currently, you know? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, and I think too, with the, the nature in which you put your head down in not only both native, but, you know, cloakroom as well, where you guys, it, it just seems to me, especially with the trajectory of how you approach not only releasing music, but um, the, uh, you know, visuals attached to the art, like everything that you do seems very deliberate. And I know that obviously most bands want to be classified as that. They're not just being like, Oh, whatever, dude, like we'll just throw a bunch of crap at the wall. But <laughs> It, it does seem like very calculated and the idea that you are looking for more um, longevity rather than the idea that, oh man, we, we're going to tour 300 days out of the year for the first three years. And if it doesn't work, then like we're done. And it just never seemed like, I mean, even with Native, even though it's obviously a much shorter burst of activity, it just didn't seem like that was the approach for any of the stuff you've done. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, like I know personally for myself, I just, I want to be able to do this for as long as humanly possible and like whatever it takes to make that happen. You know, like I know I've, I've pretty much accepted the fact that I'm never ever going to like suddenly become an overnight pop star and, and have like this insane career trajectory. Like I think I'm about where I'm going to be and I'm happy with that because I'm in a great place and I'm really, really fortunate to be where I'm at. But for me, it's like you said, longevity is everything. It's like, this is the thing I really love to do. I love playing music. I, you know, I touch the guitar as many times as I can every day because I genuinely love to do it. It isn't, you know, it isn't work to me um, in any way. Like I, I still, I love it as much as I did day one still, you know, here I am, uh, you know, what, I don't know, maybe 18 years later. I don't know how long it's been now, but um I, I think like, and I, and I recognize, I guess I, that's been the big learning process. It's like, you learn, how do you make that realistic? You look for guidance. I look at people like Steve Malcolmus, that's like in his fifties and he's been doing this, you know, since he was a teenager. It's like, wow, how's that guy had such a, a long and successful career? Well, here's the things he did, you know? So, um, I look you know, there are, there are people I look to like older people that are down the road from me that, that have been doing it for 10 years longer or 15 years longer or 20 years longer. And I study them. It's like, okay, they did this and this works. So this is how I have to do it. You know? So, um, it's never been like, 
yeah, like you said, like an aggressive burn, I'd like to have a slow burn, you know, and, and keep it burning as long as possible. If I can be doing this, I mean, geez, if I could be doing this in my 60s and 70s, then, you know, no matter what level I'm at, I'll just be happy to have done it this long. Louisville vegan jerky. That's a sentence, right? Now, trust me, this stuff is the best vegan jerky on the market, bar none. And this converts, in my opinion, even the most hardcore carnivores into trying it and being like, you know what? This stuff is, uh, is better than the quote unquote original. And what I love about this company is that they know their flavors. They got maple bacon. They got buffalo dill. They have smoked black pepper and my own personal favorite, Smoky Carolina Barbecue. Go visit lvjco.com. They're in their 10th year of existence. They will give you a nice 10% off coupon once you dive onto the website and sign up to their email list. And trust me, just order their starter pack, sample it out, and you will love them. Again, go to lvjco.com, find out all about the cool stuff that this company is doing, and ultimately, eat good jerky. Thanks, Louisville. BetMGM, an authorized gaming partner of the NBA, welcomes basketball fans with a slam dunk offer. Simply place a $10 money line wager on any game. If either team hits a three-pointer, you'll automatically receive $200 in bonus bets. Just use bonus code JERSEY200 when you place your bet. Enjoy this NBA season like never before with a variety of parlay selection features, player props, and the best daily promotions in the business. Download the app or go to betmgm.com and use bonus code JERSEY200 to win $200 in bonus bets if either team hits a three-pointer in the game you wager on. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. New Jersey only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. First online real money wager only. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets. Bonus bets expire seven days from issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. I uh, I would be remiss if I did not punish you about Matt Talbot because, uh, yeah. I mean, Hum is one of my favorite bands of all time as well, and I know that's a huge, influ- yeah, a huge <laughs> influence on you guys. And um, in recording with him, it's been really interesting because he's not an entirely prolific uh, recorder as far as, you know, engineer, whatever you want to call him, producer. Um, but like the records that he works on are always like, wow, like I can hear Matt Talbot all over it. And um, I'm sure you have either funny and or interesting stories about, you know, working with him and probably being shocked that he wanted to work with you on your band as well. Um, yeah. So when I say his name, like what kind of, uh, you know, jiggers in your head? Um, you know, I, I feel so fortunate to be able to call him a good friend. You know, um, I still get the jitters every time I see him text me or call me, like I'm still so psyched on it, you know, and I know that like we're buddies, like I can't, I can't wear that on my sleeve around him. I can't just be like a fanboy. Like I have, you know, cause we're friends now. Like we've, we've spent a lot of time together. We've made records together. We've played shows together. So like our, our relationship has advanced, you know, but, um, Matt is just, He's a hero, you know, to me, he's, you know, he's a, just a role model. He's such an influence. I think that to speak to what you just said, that like when you hear records, he engineered sounding like him, it's because I think everyone shares my, everyone that records with him shares my mentality that you're like psyched to just be in the room with him and you you, you know, he is the center of the room when he's in the room. Like he just becomes it because you're all in awe that you're in the room with him. It just is like, it's a, it's an experience that I hope many musicians get to experience going to his studio and getting to work with him. Um, but yeah, I, we've had so many great times making further out with him was one of the highlights of my life, you know, um, just being in a studio with him for, you know, several days and, and just kind of, getting to watch him work and watching him get into our band and learn our band and, and just the way that we kind of grew together in that time and, and, and how our relationship has been since then. It's amazing. You know? And like I said, we're getting ready to do this gig with him here on Friday and uh, I'm just psyched. I'm psyched to get to see him. I'm psyched to get to play with him. And like, you know, I'm, you know, I don't know, like I said, I, it's something I'm still coming to terms with because like I, I like Tom, 
a lot before I ever met him. And when we knew we were going to do our record with him, it was like, whoa, that's like pretty crazy. You know, it's crazy <laughs> that like he wants to do this. Like, and, and once we were in the studio with him, I mean, it was just a whirlwind of emotions and it continues to be, you know? Yeah, for sure. So you're, yeah, circle back in about 10 years and maybe you can contextualize that appropriately. I hope so. I don't like, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I don't, I, it's been, it's been, you know, it's been geez, seven ish years now that I've, I've known him or, or maybe even more. Well, I guess it's been actually more like 10 years because native recorded at his studio, not with him, but we recorded our last record there. And that's when I met him. And when I met him, I was like, you know, I didn't think I'd get to meet him. I knew we were going to his studio, but I didn't think, I thought it was a situation where it was like, yeah, he's the landlord and he like oversees this property, but like he only goes to the studio when he's recording bands he really likes, you know, and he showed up one morning and he made us pancakes and I was like geeking. I was like, are you serious right now? Like, <laughs> You're like I can't eat Matt's pancakes. <laughs> yeah. I was like freaking out. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is just silly. Like this is, you know, and then I, yeah, like I said, like I, when he was so humble and he was so kind and he just isn't, he's just him. Like he doesn't come off in any sort of way. Like he, you know, he's so unsuspecting. Um, so when Cloakroom was going to record with him, like when we had established that and we'd only corresponded with him via email, I was kind of telling, you know, Matt, or, I'm sorry. I was kind of telling Doyle and Brian at the time, I was like, you know, like he's pretty quiet and, and he's like, really seems like really professional and he's a really nice guy, but like, we're probably going to have to like find our own fun after hours, you know? And then once he was like there and we were in the room with him, he was just like an absolute wild man. And we had a blast and he just like totally caught us off guard. He was like so much fun. He's so hilarious. Um, he just puts you at ease. And like I said, I, I'm, I was so struck by how humble he was because like he, he had to have known that we loved hum. Like he, like if you heard our band, you have to know, you know? And then there were just nights when, we would be hanging out after recording all day and we might be like upstairs, you know, in the apartment having a beer together and we'd just be talking about being in bands and stuff. And he would be like, Oh yeah. Like my, my, my band hum did that like so casually. And I'm like, dude, I know, like, I know you did. Like I, I watched the video or like, I, you know, like I, right. totally. I, I witnessed that like, you don't have to be humble, dude. Like I know who you are, you know, but he, he never would, would, would air himself that way. He would, he was always so just like, he always just acts like he just, you know, he assumes you don't know who he is, you know? Right. So, yeah. He's playing a local band, right? Yeah. <laughs> actually, that's how he carries himself. It's like, yeah, you know, like he, you know, it's like when you hear your buddy's dad's in a band and then like, Oh, you, you know, they do a mean cover of hotel California, you know, like, except, you know, it's like that, except then he's in home and it's like, Whoa, you know, like that's <laughs> totally. Pretty- it's pretty outrageous. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible. Um, two last things I want to hit you on where, uh, one of them is a, is a, I wouldn't call it a confrontational question, but so here I am living in Southern California, never, ever, ever being captured by the, uh, race car world industry. Uh, Yeah. Anything from that perspective. Like I understand it's important to many people's lives and I know it's important to you and your father's life. Um, so what, if you can, and I don't need like an elevator pitch, you can obviously describe it however you like, but, you know, try to convince me a person who, uh, I'm not dubious of the sport. Cause I understand, like I said, it's a valuable thing, but I'm like, what, what do I have to be interested in this? Like convince me, which I know is a little bit confrontational, but what, what gravitates you towards besides obviously your father's passion for, um, you know, NASCAR and race cars and stuff like that. What kind of made it your own because i'm sure you had to go through a process like that yeah i i would say i mean it 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 was it's definitely exposure therapy i mean i was just i was born at racetracks you know i was right going, right going the races in the womb it for real i really well i have hearing i have the hearing damage to to prove it you know so um i would say you know i i just accept it isn't for everyone you know i think like you have to have a real interest in automotive things you have to be in the engines or be in the cars or be in like any aspect of it like i i don't i don't expect to ever turn just you know just everyone onto it you know like um 
I think there has to be some interest in, and in even like, oh, I dig motorcycles or I dig vintage cars or I dig something to like be able to appreciate it because it is like a very, very niche thing. It is NASCAR is huge and Formula One's huge and IndyCar is huge, but like there's still, when it comes down to like just things in the world, they are like really niche still, you know? And I would say if it, if it wasn't for my household and my upbringing, I probably wouldn't be into it because I'm not even like really a car guy. Like I don't even like, I have like a 1995 Chevy S10 truck, you right? Know? And, and like, <laughs> right. I, and I I put ten dollars of gas in it every once in a while. Like I, I, you know, like I don't take care of it. I don't care. Like I think I just was brought up around it. And I think the fact that like it is like a thing that was between my grandfather and my dad, and now my dad and me, that's what makes me love it. And I think I've just come to love it through, like I said, like exposure therapy. Like I just that was all we did. That's all we talked about. That's all we watched in my house when I was growing up. And then when I got older, um, you know, when I started to get like into my teens and I was really getting into music, there was definitely a point where I was like, man, this is lame. And like racing's for rednecks. And like, I don't care about this, you know, like I care about punk music and skateboarding and that's it, you know? And like, I think like there were a few things that kind of brought me back around to it full circle. And now, now I'm old enough to kind of appreciate it for what it is and appreciate it, you know, it, what the role that it plays in my life, you know? So, um, most of the time when I meet people, it, it doesn't really come up unless they bring it up, like, unless they ask me about it. Um, or like they happen to like, I don't know, be wearing like a racing shirt or something weird. Like I might talk about it, you know, but like, um, I recognize it's like, it is my thing, you know? And like the, the cloakroom dudes, they share it. Like Doyle, believe it or not, he had some weird connection where like he was going to these really niche races with his stepdad. So like when we, when he and I reconnected for this band, that was like something I was like tripping on. I was like, Whoa, dude, like had I known that a long time ago, we would have been like way faster friends, you know? And, uh, Tim's like super into like motorcycles and, in and just, you know, me- you know, mechanical engineering and, and all things. So like he has an appreciation for it and he's, I think like fascinated by it. And now it's like, I don't know. It's just like a thing. Like it, it is kind of like this weird, like background thing. Like we were having practice on Friday night and I just had like a race on in the background, like on, on a, on my computer, just like keeping an eye on it. Something that we talk about, you know, obviously my, my role and like what I was, you know, what I've been doing and, and working, in the field that I've been working in recently, it's made it more of a thing, you know, had I not just never done that. But the fact that I ended up kind of like working and racing in a lot of ways that definitely like made it more of a thing, but I don't know. It is like, I know it's like a really niche thing and I know it's, it's a hard sell. It is like, (laughs) yeah, you're like, I, you're like, I recognize all the hurdles that people have to jump over in order to get into it, but you're like, but if you get into it, let's talk about it. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Oh, I mean, like when I find out, especially people that are in music. Cause there's not a lot of us. There's not a lot of musicians that dig racing. Obviously that was good. Honestly, that was going to be my, my follow-up question just because, you know, as people, especially because, you know, punk, hardcore metal, whatever you want to call it has existed for a long period of time, especially of the independent variety mm-hmm. that now that people have grown up in it and are doing, you know, real life things, they are able to interact with quote unquote civilians that, <laughs> you know, have no context for, you know, the, whatever the jokes you were making earlier about, you know, live music bands or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, so is there like, have you met people that there is a sort of intersection between, you know, punk and hardcore and then getting into to racing? Yeah, there's a few, there's a few of them out there. Um, and I think now that I've been, you know, on now that I've like been on the, on the TV show and, and I, I think like it's a little more broadcasted that like I'm, I am this person that like kind of, has a foot in each camp. Um, they're sort of starting to gravitate to me a little more. Um, I think that there's a number of people that probably w- have an interest in it and, and, and maybe I call them closet race fans. Um, because <laughs> sure. like, obviously like for a lot of reasons, it's probably, especially people in our industry, like it's not, maybe not something you feel comfortable with broadcasting. Cause it does have like a lot of negative, connotations or it can have negative connotations tied to it. But like, obviously that's not like, I think when you, when you meet me and I'm like, 
this 30 something year old vegan dude that like plays in like a shoegaze band and like, you know, is like a pretty outwardly progressive person. And then I happen to love auto racing. You must be like, Oh, okay. So it's not all just this way. Like, obviously there's some like there. Okay. Then like you can, you can, you can be into those things and be into this. So like I, I've had a few people reach out to me and be like, Hey man, like I grew up watching NASCAR and like, I didn't think anybody thought that was cool. I was like, Oh yeah, man, let's talk about it. You know, like that's cool. Like let's get into it, you know? So, um, like I said, I think there, there are a lot of challenging aspects, like obviously like with auto racing, um, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of, a lot of the fan base definitely is coming from another, <laughs> another side of the coin, and uh it can be really challenging to sort of tune that out it makes a lot of noise you know and and i and it is something i've struggled with like i'm not i'm not trying to separate the art from the artist if you will you know what i mean like i i recognize that like yeah man like you know the i think the typical racing fan you know has this personal these personality traits or has these interests or these beliefs you know and like i i am the odd person out like i'm I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've connected with like a couple other vegan racing fans, <laughs> which is like, it's we, amazing. yeah, we, I mean, we laugh about it, you know, but like, obviously if I go to a racetrack, there ain't going to be any food for me, you know? And like, that's like definitely a, you know, I, like I said, like, I, I think like I kind of broke the archetype of, of the racing fan in a lot of ways, you know? And like, I think it, it's cool. It works both ways. Cause I think like, if you, you know, if you're like, uh, I, I, you know, I, like, I don't know. I don't want to get too political on this, you know, but, um, sure. You know, well, you, you can, you can at least, I mean, I, I see kind of the road you're heading down where, you know, even if you're encountering people that clearly, like you said, are on the other side of the coin is you, them being able, I mean, first of all, them being able to engage with a person who it's just like, what the hell's a vegan? Like, I, I don't even know what that is. Like, yeah, you will at least open up their lens to consider a different point of view. And I think that, is incredibly important no matter what circles you travel in because people will then at least have a touch point for a person who is a thing and they'll be able to at least have some context of it in their head. Yeah. I mean, I I've, I've tried to make it a point in my life to just get like everyone to get along. Like I just want everyone to like, I want, I want, I always want there to be peace in either just my local community or like, the country as a whole or the world as a whole in any way that I can like bridge gaps, you know, like whether it's like metal fans and like indie fans, you know, and music, or it's like non vegans and vegans. Like, and now with this, with this, you know, now with my involvement in racing, it's like, you know, if you grew up in a household in a, in a progressive household and, and you were, you know, you've, you've come to believe that racing is just for, for your know, jerks and, and, and rednecks and hicks if you meet me maybe you're like oh wow like maybe that's that's maybe i've got that wrong and then vice versa like if you think like you know if you think liberal people are out to get you and <laughs> you know we're here to you know liberal people are here to, to to ruin your way of life or whatever and you meet me and then and like i said i'm a vegan musician that that loves racing you're like oh wow like you know i hope that like there's just you know i like to be a common ground for for people from different walks of life that like you can relate to a lot of people and bring people together. And whether that's with cloakroom or whether that's with like my involvement with racing or like anything that I do, I always have it in my mind that I want to like bring people together, you know, and like create some common ground, you know, like, cause there's just so much division in our world, you know, and it's like insane. Like we're all humans. Like we're all strangers in this place, regardless of like what you believe and like what you do. Like we don't really, none of us really know why we're here and why we're doing this, you know? So like, I've always been of the belief that like, we got to get along and find ways to get along. And like, it just so happens that like, I'm into these two vastly different worlds with that, that are, you know, inhabited by di very different kinds of people. And, you know, I, I hope if anything, if anything comes of all of this, I hope that like, I can, I can just kind of, knock some of the barrier down and, and, and be a bridge for two very different kinds of people from different walks of life, life to be able to get along together. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. No, I totally get it. Um, and, and the last thing in regards to, you know, I, I, the documentary, you know, TV, TV show 
films that you're kind of working on the the creative process clearly in getting a record together and recorded is you know there are similar threads of that when you're talking about what you can do on the you know narrative side of uh, filmmaking w- what sort of I guess similarities have you noticed between you know creating both of those uh, pieces of art, or is it just like a completely different side of your brain that you are activating on? Um, you mean between between writing music and 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 then visual the visual end of things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say, you know my my interest in film and my interest in video, it came before it came before I learned to play music. And I, and I think when it, when I first was getting into it, it was through my father. Like my dad, my dad was kind of like, I wouldn't call him like a video nerd, but he like, he definitely would like tape things off of cable on a VCR and he'd make weird tapes. And he like, he had a camcorder. He always had cameras and he was always using them. And he taught me to use them at a really early age. And I didn't see that ever as like an art form early on. I think like, it didn't occur to me that it was an art form. It, it was more so just like, I don't know what it was. Like it was just capturing, capturing life for, 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 for reviewing later, you know? So, um, and then I think like once I started playing music, I was already, you know, I was still like the, the video came right with it. You know, I had a camcorder and I was filming us playing really bad Nirvana covers in my basement, you know, like, we were making really primitive music videos um, without even really thinking about it. So um, luckily for me, I feel like I've, they've always, it's always been sort of a natural expression. Like I haven't had to like think too much about it or, or channel like any part of my brain in particular. Like, I think like, I think a lot of the art that I do, I just kind of like fell into it and was doing it before I really realized what it was. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I would say, and, and now I think now that I'm older, if anything, I've learned to kind of separate it and, and kind of understand a little bit better mechanically how those parts of my brain work and how to better use them. You know what I mean? Like I've learned to separate the video from the audio end of things and learn how to like, augment them and how to complement one another if that makes sense yeah oh absolutely i mean especially to the idea of applying yourself to any creative pursuit or output it's you are existing in some of the same you know mental head spaces but then the actual creation of it is next to impossible to articulate like how you got to it it's like well it was a series of like a thousand decisions <laughs> It's yeah. like, that's where, that's how we got there. Exactly. Yeah. I think what's cool about, you know, the video stuff that I'm doing now, it's like primarily, you know, obviously I, I still am making like documentaries and then working on the television show. Um, you know, those things are, are definitely influenced by, you know, especially with the TV show, I kept likening it to making an album, you know, and I was telling like my buddy, Matt Dillner, that's the, uh, the co-host of Lost Speedways and the executive producer. I was telling him like when we were when we were writing the show and we were doing like a lot of the, the post-production work, I'm like, man, this is like, this is seriously like making a record. Like we're, we're, we're mixing the record right now, buddy. Like we're mastering the record right now. Like a lot of the process was the same. And I, I think like I was up for the challenge because of that. Um, with the music videos that I do, I, I, I approach them as a musician first. I learn I learn the song that I'm working on. I learn how it goes. I learn the dynamics. And then my, the visuals that I come up with are influenced by that, you know? So um, I almost think of myself as like an auxiliary member of the band when I'm making these videos and I'm, 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 I'm not playing an instrument, I'm making the visuals, but it goes with the song, you know, it's not, I, I think like they go hand in hand, you know, the, the, the workflow is so intertwined at this point, you know what I mean? Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's like, they can't be, especially too, where, bands of an independent variety uh you know have like negative five dollars to record a music video yeah (laughs) it's just like it's like you have to get in really deep in order to make it not only attached to the band but enough to be able to cut through to their fans and obviously have it resonate and identify with them that they'll actually watch a you know three and a half minute video or whatever oh of course yeah no i mean obviously 
you know, I'm, I, I'm always like honored that anybody ever wants to work with me in any capacity. So it's always like, well, I got to do this justice. I got to do your song justice. I got to do all of this process justice, you know? So, uh, I really, it's a, it's always a deep dive. Every project is such a deep dive and you, and you're right. There are so many things to consider. It's like, how do you, how do you bring this to life and what is life? Like, what is this state that you're trying to bring this song to? It's already a living, breathing thing. What is the next dimension and how do we get to it? You know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, Bobby, I appreciate you hanging out and uh, not trying to strong arm me into liking racing. I will respect your opinion where you're coming from. (laughs) Look, when we come to Southern California, we're definitely going to go catch a sprint car race. You're going to come with cloakroom <laughs> in the van. We're going to have a day off. It's perfect. And, and we're just going to, we're going to, you and I will bring our own vegan snacks. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So that's we'll okay. Get all, yep. We'll get it set up. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's good. I, you will give me the ideal situation in which I should experience this and your passion will then bleed over to me. And I'll be like, you know what, Bobby? You were right. Yeah, you were right. That's all I ask. Like I said, there's, a, there's. I think there's been a number of musicians now that, like, you know, when they find out that I'm into it, they're at least like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. You know, tell me more about it. You know, so if if you had any chance at becoming a fan of racing, it's through me. Okay, uh, so. <laughs> that is ve- that is very very true. I, I I think that's uh that's where everybody can start. So yeah, everybody can just uh, email Bobby and that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, you know what? I on your podcast, I will open myself up. If there's anyone listening to this that has any mild interest in this and and they're interested in, in possibly coming over the fence, you get in, you get in touch with me and I will <laughs> I'll make myself available if I have to start traveling across the country to to accompany people to their first races i'll do it that's so good you could be the uh you know traveling uh race evangelist that's and, right and, uh, as long as it sticks up with uh cloak rooms uh touring opportunities then i think you got a you got a solution there that's what i'm saying <laughs> yeah you want to that'll be like our you know the vip packages it's like you pay you pay an extra 50 bucks and you get to come to the venue early and eat brunch with us. Well, instead you come to a sprint car race with us, you know, <laughs> dude, totally. You're like, you know what? I could tell you what people don't want. It's an, it's my autograph, but yeah. what people do want is a race experience. Yeah. Come, let's go sit in the grandstands and, and, you know, have a good time. That's all we can do. Yeah. I love it. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, Bobby. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, just the interest and, and, and this was so much fun. I, I can't wait to, uh, to, to give it a listen and, and tell everyone to tune in. What a damn sweetheart he was, right? Bobby, great hangs. Thank you for coming on the show. Special shout out to Bailey, who is uh, the publicist of the stars. And uh, she always uh, brings good ideas to my table. And I love working with her. So big shout out to both of them. Next week, I have uh, a member of Chain of Strength, which is awesome to say. I have Ryan Hoffman, who was in Chain of Strength. And he also has been running a really, really cool record label called Quiet Panic Records over the past, I would say about four or five years, has put out a lot of cool stuff, Spiral Heads, and most recently, a band called Slow Crush that I've fallen in love with, and uh, just a really cool label. Ryan uh, approached me a few months back to be like, hey, I want to, you know, kind of get the word out more about the label. And, uh, you know, we discussed in the past some uh, some chain of strength business. I was trying so desperately to book them on Sound and Fury when I was uh, when I was doing that festival. It never ended up happening, but, um, you know, I tried for many years. But regardless, chain of strength, incredible band, one of my all-timers. And uh, yeah, I was just able to have a conversation with Ryan and it was great. So until next week, please be safe, everybody. You know what it's like to endlessly seek a remedy. Are you ready for a prescription that's once daily steroid-free? Vitama to Pinarov Cream 1% is a prescription topical treatment for adults with plaque psoriasis. Do not use if you're allergic to Vitama Cream. The most common side effects of Vitama Cream include red raised bumps around the hair pores, pain or swelling in the nose and throat, skin rash or irritation, including itching and redness, peeling, burning or stinging, headache, itching and flu. Tell your doctor about all the medicines you take, and if you're pregnant or plan to be, ask your doctor if Vitama Cream is right for you. You deserve more from your topical. To learn more, visit topicaluprising.com. Your favorite podcast, Therapy for Black Girls, is celebrating five years of empowering conversations as we continue to make mental health and wellness accessible. In addition to weekly chats with some of your favorite mental health professionals and other experts, we flipped through the pages of your favorite romance novels with author Tia Williams, checked in with Grammy Award-winning artist Michelle Williams, 
and talked hurdles in sports, motherhood, and mental health with Olympic athlete Natasha Hastings. From our team to your podcast app, join us in celebrating five years of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. Check it out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Bridgewater, the hit fiction podcast, is back. A supernatural thriller presented in immersive 3D binaural audio. The Bridgewater Triangle. There is some kind of mystical force in this region that attracts monsters and paranormal activity. There's something beyond our understanding going on here. Starring Supernatural's Misha Collins, The Walking Dead's Melissa Ponzio, and Rogue One's Alan Tudyk. Written by Lauren Shippen and created by me, Aaron Mankey. Listen to Bridgewater on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. 